live. Hi, friends. I hope you're having a lovely day today. I'm here with my friend William, as it says on his hangout window. Does anyone call you William? Uh, sometimes my mom does, but I don't know. My full name is William Albert Crooks. I feel like it just sounds really hoity-toity, so I think Will's just a lot. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's very elegant, and I'm sure that you could use that to, to let's say, leverage certain situations, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. If I was, <laughs> maybe if I had like a fancy coif of hair or something. Oh, a coif. Yeah, coif hair. Um, I think it would be coif. Is hair. coif hair okay? So uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about keeping creative momentum. Now this will be uh, going to video world on YouTube and audio world on my podcast. It'll be the second episode of my podcast, and I am excited to have my friend, Will, who is a street photographer. And we've been friends for a while now. I used to live in the same town as him. I got to get back over to South Carolina, Greenville, such an amazing town. There's a waterfall in the middle of downtown. That's the first thing that I tell everybody. Freaking hard. enormous waterfall. It's pretty hard to beat a waterfall. It's so extra. This is what we're all about. And bridges with suspensions only on one side. That's, that's what we're about. Exactly and elegant, but not in the same way as Asheville, North Carolina. There's a, there's a difference. There is a difference. Totally. They're separate places. Um, <laughs> physically. And physically. So, uh, so before we get into this, I, Will, how have you been? What have you been up to? What takes up most of your creative time? Uh, most of my creative time is taken up by my job. So I work um, for a publishing company that publishes like four or five, five little uh, different publications. So my fancy job title is visual director. My real job is taking a bunch of photos and sometimes helping with some art direction and kind of freelance hiring and stuff like that. So that takes up a huge chunk of my time. Um, and then... I do personal projects on the side, and that's kind of how I got into photography and how me and James met and everything was sort of street photography, street portraiture. That's sort of always been something near and dear to me in the photography world and how I got into photography. Oh, man. And the way we met was so crazy. Like you, the, it was the perfect way two street photographers could meet each other. Yes. Like we were literally, you were literally hanging out with another guy. Who is also a street photographer, and you you guys uh, or no? He asked to take a picture of me. It was the first. It was the first experience of someone doing to me what I did to everybody else. It was like inception. It was what? It was just like inception. What'd you say? Right. Well, it was. I mean, it was serendipity. It was beautiful serendipity. It's like if we would have met normal way. It's like I don't know. We, like, we met in a work environment. We passed each other, and then we slowly started talking to each other. And we we're like, oh, you like Star Wars? I like Star Wars. And you know, that's boring. That's that's so twenty oh five, right? This was incredibly. It was an elegant way to meet, and it's been a. We've been. We spent a lot of time. Uh, together since and we, we we have a I think we have a flow about our conversations that I think is fun yeah we've done it a couple times we've rambled and rambled perfect for podcasts mm -hmm. <laughs> we rambled together uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about keeping creative momentum today and I think that both you and I could have some interesting insights on that and I want to speak from the perspective not as somebody who is who is excellent at doing at doing so, but somebody who has experience trying really hard to do so. And I think that the keeping creative momentum is two things. And one, it's good for growth. It's good for building habits, for uh, longevity, as you were saying a second ago. And I think it's a, it has a lot to do with mastery as well. Yeah, no, consistently, I mean, consistently creating and sharing. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, you cannot become a master at much anything if you don't consistently do it. And momentum is a big part of sort of rolling through those rough spots and keeping up with the process again and again and again in a habitual manner. So, yeah. totally, totally. 
And I think that, you know, on the side of building habits, you're able to you're able to develop habits that people who aren't creating consistently uh, don't have access to in a sense. And then those habits become part of who you are. And they're not habits anymore. They're just kind of what you do on a daily basis. And, and it's built into your the DNA of who you are at this point. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and you, say, you said something interesting too. You said that create, creative momentum is like a muscle. And I always refer to it as a train because I think that it's a, a fantastic analogy. Train's really hard to get going. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of frustration. Uh, I, I assume the first locomotive engines when they were trying to push a train, they were like, oh, we have to carry 512 cars behind this and it still has to go. And then, um, and then they spiral into depression as one does. <laughs> And so, yeah, that, that is, and I, I think better, that yeah, that's a better analogy than a muscle. I think. No, no, it's a, I think it's a great analogy. I mean, I made it up, but I think that your analogy is equally as great because it has a lot to do with well, to us, right? Uh, this idea of flexing a muscle. If you don't, if you don't flex your arms enough, if you don't use your arms enough, they become like noodles. And the astronauts in space will. The astronauts. <laughs> If they if they stay up there too long, their bones begin to break down, their muscles begin to break down, and they atrophy, and they die. And do you want to die, Will? I do not want to die, and I do not want to not be creative. You don't. So. Right, right. So just think of the astronauts with noodle arms when you want to not create. That will be you, and it's really hard to get going, and that's where this term known as writer's block comes from, which is a weird deceiving term because it's sort of treated as in pop culture, like something that something that happens to creative people and they get stuck and they can't, they, they hit a wall and they cannot get through it. And, you know, like there's, uh, there's a whole movie that's dedicated to this, Barton Fink. Um, have you seen that movie? No, I've never seen A lot of people haven't seen that movie. Okay, um, it's by the people who, uh, it's by the same guy, the Coen brothers, the guys who made Oh Brother, Why Art Thou? Oh, okay. Huh. The whole movie is this metaphorical take on writer's block, but that's literally the whole movie is him experiencing writer's block. But uh, I think writer's block is portrayed a little bit differently than what it actually is. I think I would convert that to creator's block, and I would say that if you have creator's block, it's because you have not generated momentum in a creative process. You haven't figured out how to do that yet. And the more you do it, the the easier it gets, and it's a, it's it's sort of this, it's like a train. As you, as you get going, it starts to glide along, and things start to come easier, and you start to develop habits to push through the, the stuckness naturally. But anyway, so... Well, uh, what is your, because we all fall short, but what is your goal for how, what is your goal for momentum, creative momentum? What do you want to try to be in your head at all times? Um, I think for me, the big thing, and it's sort of been a crossover between personal and professional work, but just sort of kind of maintaining a habit of creation but within that habit, uh, trying to always push into a new realm, whether it's uh, it can be anything from a new project or it can be working on a new type of lighting or a different way of post-processing. But I sort of think it's this sort of strange in-between existence of like you're doing these creative habits consistently and yet you're also sort of broadening how you're approaching them because I think it's easy to sort of go out and habitually just do the same thing, walk the same street, look for the same thing. And like, while that has value, I think like eventually it has to be broadened for there to be a bit more growth. So it's sort of this give and take of sort of going and doing the same thing, but maybe looking for something new, having it like, being intentional through your con like a uh, continuum of habit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I think, I think it's this, 
there's like this interesting balance between between uh, digging deep into something that you have experience in and, and finding the, the deepest point of the hole that is uh, whatever your niche is and the thing that you uh, that you go after every day because I think there's value to that to really yeah absolutely. really focusing in and trying to to, to find every bit of uh, find every bit of I don't know I I, I want to say a cave but I guess that doesn't make sense because the cave is already there you want you want to keep digging down and down and down but there are also times that you should move in other directions and try to pull in. Uh, pull in inspirations from elsewhere, which will also aid in you continuing to dig deeper into a specific thing. And so I, to make this practical, I think digging deeper means if you are a street photographer and you're interested in portraits, that you focus yourself tremendously. You focus yourself on one particular type of portrait, one particular way of uh, maybe location, right? Trying to squeeze the orange that is whatever, wherever you live, uh, maybe going down the same street over and over. But it's like, then there's value within this uh, process. There's value to, to deciding to go to another street that day. That's an interesting balance. But I think it's important to think about that and be sort of aware and cognizant of that. Yeah, I think it's it's the being intentional, like not just repeating for the sake of repeating. Um, and I mean, this is coming from a guy who, it, from my background, I spent three years, uh, two or three days a week, shooting the same one one and a half mile block of city, um, and shooting street portraits there all the time, always looking for kind of a specific idea, like very much like street style, street fashion thing. And I did that every day for three years. So I guess some of it's like- How that, would you say that's helped you? Um, I think it, it is that just that constant repetition. And for me, that was a great starting point and sort of having a goal where it was like, I would post a portrait a day and maintain at least a portrait a day every day for those three years. Um, and just sort of helped me develop that foundation, which was sort of like, okay, you can now approach people and ask them for a portrait. Now, it was within sort of a safer, easier environment. It was with subjects that were more likely to say yes than maybe other types of projects. But I think it helps build that foundation, say, for when you move into producing some work where maybe you're photographing in places where people are less likely to say yes, or you'll have to do more explaining, or the subjects are just more intimidating or something. You sort of have that foundation. And without that, it's very hard to go up to a tough dude with tattoos all over his head and scars and like he's walking like a huge Rottweiler or something. It's very hard <laughs> to just go up to that guy. It's sort of like, if you don't have some sort of foundation, I think it's hard to kind of expand your work maybe into something more challenging or kind of just a different field. I think it's just like a very applicable skill set. Like if you want to be a portrait photographer, going and taking street portraits and doing it consistently is a great way to learn how to interact with people. Oh my gosh, you're serious. I mean, like, <clears throat> like I remember I it's never – this this example will never leave my mind of that time we were together downtown and you found that woman who she had blonde hair uh i forget what she was wearing exactly but right in the background uh right in the background was a couple of trash cans uh, do you yeah, remember this yeah, yeah did you get right. did you take the trash cans out of the shot no, i didn't i didn't i I, I took, I might have taken an orange cairn out of the shot, but I, I okay. framed around the trash cans. I did avoid the trash cans completely and all the people. I think the other thing was like, it was the play was going on. So there was like a zillion people in the park too. Did you rock those trash cans? That's an example of a situation that is this difficult and has a lot of obstacles to work through. And you take that, in my opinion, if you take that and apply that to a traditional portrait and figuring out how to, to work elements together, I mean, you have a tremendous head start. Yeah. You're used to working with trash cans and homeless people. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so. yeah it, it, it develops your skill set for when you get people that are 
that know they're coming to a portrait shoot and you can have a choice of location and you can have a choice of day and you can have all these options you can do a lot more with them because you're used to working with nothing sure well another thing is that you're you're working with people and you're also working with people that you have to you have to own the experience you have to ask them if you can take their photo which is an endeavor to begin with for introverted folks like we do like we are uh and and so in a studio you can take that that piece away right they already know you're going to take a photo of them you just move on to the next bit i to that as well but how so i'm curious how is the process of taking photos in a more controlled environment as you've so for uh, for everybody, he will has shifted into in spending a lot of time taking photos in environments that are relatively controlled, uh, shooting for a publication, and you you do a lot of environmental type portraits, but also a little bit more traditional portraits with really interesting lighting. A couple of your photos in a second. There's one that I want you to tell me how you lit it because it's freaking amazing. But how what what has been the difference? between the two disciplines for you um i think one of the strange things is just like for the first time in my life i could plan a shoot like i had mm. this amount of time to kind of think about what i actually wanted the photo to learn about the subject sort of it's just a very a different approach but i do think in some strange way there's something lost when you can plan and there is sort of also this strange in between where like since a lot of several of the publications we publish are um, weeklies, like some assignments I may find out the day before or the day of and kind of just go into it blind. So it is sort of, there still is sort of an overlap. And even when you bring someone in the studio, I think there is a very strong advantage to sort of having that street portrait mindset of sort of being able to roll with things quickly and adjust situations because sometimes you're shooting someone and you may have just as little time as you have on the street. You may have a few minutes. Um, other people, you may have hours, and that's been an adjustment because suddenly you're not rushing through the process and you're sort of focusing on smaller details that maybe in a street portrait you kind of have to push to the side a little bit just to, you know, to try to come back with the most compelling image. But I think it's much easier to go from working on a very, very tight time frame, like with street portraiture, into a realm where you have a lot of time because going the opposite way, talking with other photographers who work in the industry, like they're shocked when I may do a shoot in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but like compared to a street portrait, mm. right? That's a lot of time. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. And people are busy, you know? Yeah. Um, God, that's so interesting. I didn't even think about the, the time constraint and getting used to, uh, getting you well one getting used to having more time but also the ability to have more time and how it benefits you to have less time as a street photographer when you go into that situation because you're used to working really fast you have a you have a leg up that's super interesting uh so so i think a good example of something that can help you have consistent creative momentum is pr external pressure and the social pressure is an example of this. I think that having friends who you can plan things with, I think this live stream is, is an example because instead of making a video on my own, I can just kind of shoot it whenever. I have to collaborate with you. We have to get together on a time. I have to actually show up. You have to actually show up. We have to make sure that we get everything worked out from the beginning. We don't hit any hiccups in the middle of this and we have to sort of respect each other's time. That whole dynamic is really good for creating consistently and if you can find opportunities for that around you that can be tremendously valuable I, another thing that is interesting is something that you've had to experience and I, i'm interested to hear what your experience has been with this is that some sort of pressure where you're getting paid and that you have to work and you have to produce and there's the pressure of of getting something on time and the frustration of when something goes horribly wrong and you've let somebody down. Uh, have you experienced that or does everybody just bow down to you? How does that go? 
<laughs> no, uh, I mean, it moves around. I mean, some people are very excited about the process and very willing to work with you. Um, but then on the other side, like one of our publications is a weekly business magazine. And sometimes CEOs, they want the publicity for their company and they don't mind talking about it, but they really do not like having their picture taken and they really have a lot of time. So they don't have a lot of time. So that combination can be a bit challenging. I had one person who let me take five frames, like not five setups, not five minutes, but five. <laughs> At the time I snapped the button, like he started to walk away. So Wow. I mean, it, it does run that sort of gamut and there is sort of a Justin step. Timberlake or something. <laughs> he wasn't even like, screw him. this man. Yeah. So, uh, but it, I think the challenging part of the dynamic is with, especially with the weekly publications. And since you're not doing necessarily like ad work is there's a deadline and the piece has to go out a certain time. So it's like you do an ad shoot and it goes bad. Like, you know, there is a potential to redo it. But like with most of the things I shoot, mm -hmm. there's one opportunity. And it is just sort of that thing where it's like when you write, you can always call the person back and ask that question you need to ask. You know, but with photography, once you're done, you're done. <laughs> like there's some stuff mm. you can do in post, but there's not there's not saving a set of terrible images. Um, you know, you're just kind of stuck. So yeah, I mean, that was an adjustment, but I do think it's sort of when you shoot street portraiture, especially like when it's not candid, when you ask, you run into almost a similar dynamic because it's like you, the person knows you're taking their picture. They're expecting it to end up on a website. They're expecting it to end up on a website relatively soon. So even though there's not this paid dynamic, there is sort of this social obligation of like, you want to make a good picture of this person that's worth posting. You want to get it up. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Like it, it feels bad when you don't post that picture. Like if, if it, for whatever reason you miss focus, focused on the, the, the homeless person in the background, uh, you miss that, you, you miss that opportunity to share that picture. And that's, yeah, I, I totally understand that. I kind of had to shut that off. Like I, I had to go, okay, I have to make good photos first. If person doesn't get to see their photo that really sucked, but you kind of have to do what you have to do. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Oh, uh oh! I broke my cord. Fell. It's okay. No one's hurt. My toe's gone. Okay, my toe's gone. Someone's hurt. It's okay. We'll make it through. Uh, so I think that yeah, creating structure around yourself is is a fantastic way to create consistently. And I've experienced this recently editing for another YouTuber, uh, John Hill, and I have to get videos to him every day, right? And the the pressure that is put on you is something that you cannot put on yourself i think or it's 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 tremendously difficult to replicate let's put it that way yeah I can so i think it's a great way to keep yeah to, it's a great way yeah. to keep momentum so i'm curious uh yeah. go ahead no, i was just gonna say i think the peer pressure thing i mean even um back when we used to shoot together i think there was sort of like more pressure to go after the photo you wanted to take when then when you're alone it's easy to talk yourself out of it um and i still go through that with a few of the people that are still left in the greenville street portrait street photography scene which is not many but it's like when you go out with them and you both see a shot that like they know you want to get like it's good to have that pressure it's like peer pressure is going to exist no matter what positive negative but it is i just think you hit on a really big key of like and it's just, you know, all the studies you see, everything is like people won't do something if there's no accountability. Like totally. if you don't have something to lose from it or even if, you know, literally it's like financial or anything. Like if there's not something external that's pushing you forward, it's just too easy to have an excuse because there's totally, always <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, that applies to human nature in general because, you know, if it historically, if a, I don't know, a tsunami is about to hit your house, you live on a coastal city, right? It's the, it's the, you know, the volcano just blew up in the distance. It's, it's uh, 482 AD. And a tsunami is about to hit your house. Things are going to go bad. Uh, you have drive to move like you've never moved before. Because if not, you die. 
And so we as humans are, are very much wired to respond to that. And that is a hack that you can use. And uh, this is why a lot of people you'd hear, uh, you hear a lot of people say it's a really good idea to tell people when you're going to post and this and that. And I don't think that's absolutely necessary. Like if you're sharing uh, photos or if you're sharing videos on YouTube, this, this and that. I don't think that's entirely necessary, but it's it's a good idea to. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget where I was going with that. There was something interesting after that. But anyway, moving on. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, what are your weaknesses when it comes to keeping momentum? This will be fun. We can have a therapy oh. session. Oh, man. There's... All right, get the notepad out, doctor. Um, there, there is... <laughs> Of weakness. I mean, I think the first thing is uh, I'm naturally very introverted. So, and I I work in a creative field where I spend a lot of time photographing strangers, meeting them, having to engage with them, both like setting up the shoot and executing the shoot, keeping them at ease, sort of going through that whole song and dance of keeping the subject distracted and having a good time and not focus on the fact that you're pointing a camera in their face. So I totally. think like that sort of creative outlet of my job though does sort of drain my creative momentum sometimes in the process of producing my own work less from a sort of I feel like I'm, I don't feel like I'm out of creative capital but more I'm out of social capital and sort of having to make those extra interactions becomes very tough so it's sort of like totally and it, it is something that uh I think it's something that, that gets you over time and you start to just get to this constant state of exhaustion. You're like, I don't want to talk to anybody forever. <laughs> and I mean, that's how it's, that's how it's happened to me in the past. Uh, and when you put yourself in a place where you, you can sort of balance that a little bit better, things get a lot better, but it can be tough to do sometimes. And uh, I had a, when I was working at Starbucks, I had a manager who was also an introvert ironically she was one of the most socially interesting people and she was always engaged like very present worked her face off you could rely on her that sort of thing very conscientious person but she was like yeah every day i have i need to have about eight hours of alone time <laughs> i i understand yeah no, i understand I, mean, I think i think that's a big one i think the other really big factor is sort of for me too it's like when i'm creating for my profession it makes it feel like well i created something for the day so it's sort of like it's easy to check that box off and maybe too easily check it off like oh i've done this i'm not going to do that now um so I think that's sort of mm -hmm. like oh I see what you're saying. So you you've already created something, so therefore you're not going to push it a little bit harder. Yeah, it's sort of like that box gets checked, but I'm not really sometimes cognizant of checking it and being like, yeah, like I create something that's more intentional or more meaningful to me. You know, some days I have to do shoots that are just completely boring, like interiors of a new restaurant. Like it's just it, it doesn't scratch any real creative itch for what I'm interested in photographing. Um, portraiture is a little bit different, but when it's a day of interiors and factory tours and things like that, um, I don't think I've fulfilled that creative itch. But I sometimes I think just kind of check the box off as if I had. Have you developed any uh, any habits to mitigate that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I mean a big one for me is just since I kind of live and die by my Google Calendar is just setting up times where I'm going to go shoot. Yes, structure. Tell them about the structure, Will. Tell them about the structure. Well, I mean, I went to school to be an accountant, too, so that's definitely why there's some structure there. But oh, yeah. The, the Google See, you learn, you learn from every art form, Will. Yeah, so I, I, calling accounting an art form is a interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, like I live in... Oh, man, we just lost, uh, I just lost half my accountant uh, followers. <laughs> But then they'll all become all seven of them are gone. They're gonna all go and become photographers. That's what's gonna happen. Oh wow! That's what, that's what There's happens. an interesting perspective. I guess I already have that with you. Yeah, look, I'm I'm like the catalyst for this whole movement. Half the accounting market's just gonna disappear, and they're all gonna become creatives. It's gonna happen. Accountant, the accountant, Torialist. 
that's a really terrible name. No one should ever buy that. Name. That's a no, that's a great name, Will. You gotta be honest with yourself. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go with that for my blog. Even though everyone <laughs> mispronounces it anyways, but that's okay. Um yeah, so Google Calendar, Okay, like, so the, the, like, literally, Google yeah, yeah, yeah. Google Calendar is for me like the foundation of things because one like my job is all there's no natural structure it's like shoots happen wherever whenever at all times so like i have to live by my google calendar um so it's like if i put it in my calendar i at least feel a lot more guilt when i skip it because it's like an official thing i'm supposed to do for the day totally and, um, i try to tackle it like right after work like i feel like if I make that transition to like, I'm now home, I'm now comfortable, like I have taken my shoes off. Like I, it's a lot harder to sort of reset and be like, I'm going to go back into this sort of active state, creative state when I've sort of like zoned out, at least for me. Like, I'm curious kind of for you, what, what sort of structure helps you be creative after say like you've been busy doing stuff that feels and, you know, even if it's a creative thing, even if it's like editing something, but it's like maybe you're editing something that's, you know, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for me, what I've learned is it's just been a, it's been a combination of structure, a really interesting calendar app that I actually want to open, like that's, you know, designed well. I feel like I'm having an experience when I open the app. Uh, creating that, turning that into a finite thing, like a single point of productivity, as opposed to this vague thing that I'd like to do. It's that combined with sheer freaking willpower <laughs> and priority and just saying, I need to do this. It doesn't feel good, but s screw that. I need to do this. And I think that like I've, every day I try to get up and I try to, to, approach it that way and there recently i've learned how to go into this sort of brute force mode where i'm like so for example they say it's a good idea to make your bed in the morning i when i make my bed i just i look at the bed and i can make two decisions i can say i i'll do that later or never or tomorrow i don't know i got a busy day or i can look at that bed and go freaking make the bed <laughs> just do it right and this is a never-ending thing and what happens to me is i enter this weird disassociative state i think is a good way to explain it where i'll, I'll fall into what is sort of pseudo productivity and i'll maybe this means that i just end up scrolling through instagram maybe this means that i'm taking i'm taking on smaller things that don't actually mean anything and maybe aren't actually anything that i meaningful but i feel like they're meaningful in some sense in some vague sense in my head and i use that to avoid the thing that i really need to do which is scaring me okay. and this was what i was talking about in my last uh my the what I just recorded earlier, the anxiety is a huge part of mastering your craft or the, I guess the opportunity for anxiety and coming out of your comfort zone and uh, punching the anxiety in the face is that is the way to go. That is how you can start to create structure and start to master your craft. But, uh, but it's difficult. And, it, and, and I think that, it's, it takes this intentional everyday mentality to get up and and have finite things. I think there's tremendous value to having very finite things. You choose how finite you want that to be. So if you want that to be a calendar event or to do that, it actually has a time to it. That's probably a really good idea. I don't think you necessarily have to, but I'm sure there's some sort of social scientist that says that that's a fantastic game plan. But just having that there, having it written down and saying, what am I supposed to do today? Oh, yeah, there's this list that I made earlier. <laughs> I'm going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go after that. And just the sheer willpower, and the more you do it, it gets, it gets more and more built into who you are, I guess. Does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you hit on like a point that I think a lot of people don't like to talk about, which is the sort of willpower and the fact that like, it sucks sometimes like most of the time like yeah it's like 
it's not like i mean i've probably taken over 2000 street portraits but like it's still hard to do it most of the times mm -hmm. i do it like it's not it's like the most depressing thing i think when i told somebody that and they want to do street photography and they're like oh man it just must be like you just run up to these people and you're just like hey let me get that picture girl and it's <laughs> right but like every time i feel like it's the first one all over again but i mean there is that momentum too like relating back to your training analogy like we me and you have always talked about the first photo of the day like how hard the first photo of the day is yeah, yeah. And like you get two photos and then you get three and it's like holy crap then you're just like flat like you're just you oh yeah rolling you know where you're, yeah that's like you're doing backflips to the street yeah. it's like some sort of uh i don't know some sort of mary poppins music video you got umbrellas. You're flying around, spinning around in circles. Have you seen that Mary Poppins uh, GIF? I'll show you when we do the screen sharing. All right. It's a Mary, po it's a Mary Poppins meme, but she's spinning in the field. But she has two Uzis that are firing automatically as she's spinning. It's amazing. <laughs> it's life giving. Yeah. So I think that's like that. It's going to be hard. Is just a very good point, and that like. Just because you've been doing it a long time doesn't mean, and even when it's a part of you, it doesn't mean that like you just wake up and creating. I mean, yeah. If it was that way, we would all just do so much more of it all the time. And I think the other thing you hit on that is a huge one for me that I didn't think about was like, I'll do other things that aren't really that important. Or sometimes conversely, like I'll go on a photo walk, but like I won't, I'll, I'll be shooting but I really won't be in that headspace of shooting. And it's like, sure, okay, good. Like, I got outside, I went for a walk, whatever. But, like, was that really the best use of my time? Like, because I wasn't really being intentional about it. And I think it's easy to sell yourself on that idea of, like, you went out and did it, but you weren't really intentional and you weren't really pushing yourself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do it. You're like, oh, well, I got this one picture that was convenient or... I snapped this one pretty picture of these these guys, you know, these birds flying, and you're like, "What do you? Is that like what you're trying to work on?" You're like, "Oh no, not really. I just took it because I need to take a picture." Right? Like it's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, totally. Totally. So I think it is sort of that like that willpower, that sort of intentionality, whether it's like a time slot or something, and then also once you get there to do it, you still have to actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that what what generating momentum towards whatever thing that's that scares you, because I do think that that being scared of is a lot of the reason why we why we don't do things. We're scared of the commitment. We're scared of any number of things, right? And what I what I've learned is that the going after something consistently and pushing yourself through that that friction every single day what it does is it takes the it takes the edge off of the anxiety and the frustration because and then creates new frustration but at least now you're moving yeah. but it takes it takes the edge off of that and then you start to build a flow and if you do it enough you do it consistently you start to find some uh, you start to find enough victories that you start to really feel good about yourself then it gets easier, then it gets incredibly easy. And then who knows, maybe two years down the road, you go, oh, this is just a thing that I do. This is just natural. But it takes a tremendous amount of time. Another thing that I wanted to touch on was we talk about how it sort of sucks almost all the time in a sense. But within that, so there, so there are a lot of different states the human creature can be in. And I think that one of the worst ones is is sort of misery and, and depression, if you will. And that's that's basically you that's that's you not doing anything useful. It's not it's you not moving at all. And what you get coupled with the suckishness of trying to push yourself is fulfillment. It actually feels really good. It's like flexing a freaking muscle. Well, it's like flexing a muscle. There we go, circling it's, back. <laughs> it's difficult, but it's addicting and it's amazing at the same time. And but that is completely different than comfort and pleasure. Those are those are separate, right? You can experience pleasure within this, but 
or, or even comfort. There's a there's a point where you sort of wrangle the chaos that is everything that's happening around you enough that you start to get a little more comfortable and you start to experience play. Those things are sort of side, I guess, side effects or side, you know, they come along. But but it's this friction between pushing yourself and fulfillment. And it's something that you feel when you actually feel like you're doing something meaningful. That That is what to go after. That felt like a weird sentence. That's what you should go after. And it's hard to explain that to somebody who doesn't have discipline because they tend to err on the side. They don't quite understand what that fulfillment means. They go, oh, it sucks? Oh, I'm going to... You know, watch Netflix. <laughs> yeah. Go back to my yeah. job, watch Netflix, not do anything yeah. particularly uh, interesting with my entire life and die. All right. Like you have to have that sort of sucking and that conflict and that pushing out of the comfort zone to feel like you've achieved something, which creates like a degree of pleasure or comfort or like accomplishment, whatever you want to call it. There is sort of, because if you don't like the lack of any sort of suffering means there can't really be any sort of substantial high or excitement about what you did accomplish because like there's no basis to put it against you're just like oh i'm always kind of even keeled on this instead of like i worked really really hard and 90 percent of these photos are terrible but like i'm proud of this image or Mm -hmm. this image means something to me right now it may not mean anything to you next week or like a year from now you may go this is the worst photo ever why did i even post this but it's sort of that gradual foundation. And it's good. If you look back a year later and you're like, wow, my photos used to be really terrible, it probably means that you've got better because your perspective on what is good for yourself has hopefully risen instead of being like here perpetually. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and uh, who knows? Maybe you'll do something meaningful through that process. And maybe you'll become a more disciplined person in general, which is a good thing. Uh, but it's like, it's like this deceiving if you just want to pursue instant pleasure and something that makes you feel really nice. That's, that has a shelf life. (laughs) It doesn't, it doesn't really, doesn't really mean anything in the end, I guess. Uh, that got super existential there. So, uh, what do you feel like are your, your strengths when it comes to this stuff? Um, I mean, I think some of the strength is just sort of like I've been building this momentum for six years now. And there's been some lapses or even some, it was a couple lapses, but I think there was also shifts and sort of where the momentum took me and what kind of things I was focused on learning or working towards in the creative realm um, that related more to kind of the job I have now and like wanting to do what I currently am employed to do um but i think it was sort of having that sense of discipline i mean i think having that goal for three years and not missing a day involved a lot of things because this was i was going to school full-time i had a part-time job and then on top of that i was trying you know i was probably shooting 20 hours a week to make sure i had seven portraits every week and there was probably one year where i posted two portraits a day every day for a year yeah um so i mean sort of that that groundwork of just you know will doesn't talk to his family much (laughs) no it was i I don't know it was definitely a a good escape too i mean it was like it was fulfilling and it gave me a creative outlet which i'd never really pursued before um i used to just play sports and stuff Mm -hmm. numbers (laughs) Mm -hmm. but uh i don't know i mean i think that's that's part of it and i think it is just sort of uh surrounding i think i've done a pretty good job trying to surround myself with people who are also creative whether they're photographers or artists or creators or right you know even people who have a right you know jobs but like it's good to surround yourself with those people because you know they say you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around totally like when I hang out with most of my friends, you know, it's like if I'm hanging out with you, if I'm talking with you, even though you don't live here anymore, it's like we're having a conversation about creativity. We're talking about photography. You know, mm-hmm. if I'm here with, say, my friend Jose, like we are going out and shooting. Like we're not going to a bar to get drinks, like and just shooting, you know, talking about whatever. Like it, it's generally sort sports of into that creative realm 
And when your sort of free time is based around that and your friend circle is based around that, you're just going to do it more. So I think like building that network, even if it's just a few people, like I don't have a huge friend network, but it's finding people that are interested in the same thing that are going to push you to be more creative and also just sort of give you opportunities to go do it while also socializing. So sort of two birds, one stone. Yeah. And when I think, I think it, help it builds this momentum wave <laughs> that you can ride and it makes things easier and what you develop is what you want which is which is a drive and an interest to actually create and do the hard stuff because uh, when your brain when you create your brain starts to produce whatever combination of chemicals it would produce to make you really interested and for me it, it turns into a little bit obsessed with creating more so i will start to if i get one solid really inspirational to me thing done that day and it's early in the day i go all right what's next let's let, i'm going to build a i'm going to build a house let's do this and that kind of happened today right like i did a i did a a quick video that i felt really good about today now I am doing this and it just kind of led in. Now we've been planning this, so it worked out really well. But like I've had a fantastic day comparatively to some other days because of this momentum. So that's sort of on a micro level. But if you generate that over time, this is the goal, right? Is to gen generate that consistently over time, you start to build it on a macro level. And then you start to go, 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 go. It works its way into your your mood state and everything about you. And then you're doing, oh my gosh, it's knocked over a lamp. Then you're doing, uh, th then you're kind of where you want to be more and more. I think that having friends around you is a really good way, back to what we were talking about earlier, to generate and keep that momentum. And it's, it has a unique way of doing it. Like, it's just like, I don't, maybe it's like, I don't really want to hang out with Jose tonight. Um, but he said he wanted to hang out. We haven't hung out in a little while. I guess I'll push myself a little bit. It's always good. I'm going to do that. And then you go and then you're like, why don't I do that every day? That's that was amazing. That was a lot of fun. And that is that is the creative process in a nutshell, because you 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 say to yourself something along the lines of most of the time you're going to say to yourself something along the lines of Ugh, I just don't want to like that takes I got to grab this thing uh, do this and got to set up if you're making videos got to set up the lighting got to set up all the stuff that has to do with this i gotta oh i gotta plan a video right uh and i think that i think that it's the same thing as hanging out with a friend where it sort of generates some momentum unless you're a raging extrovert uh, you have to generate some momentum to get up and go but when you do it, it's so fulfilling and it's so worth it in the end. Even if, for whatever reason, there were some challenges, some obstacles that you had to overcome to get there. Uh, it's like it's like like I went to my cousin's wedding recently that was in Virginia. Now, Will, I don't know if you know this, but Virginia is a couple miles away from Utah. Just a couple. It took some. It took some doing. It took a little bit of planning and some money, and this sort of thing. I had to take a plane, take another plane, had to drive deep into the the armpit of Virginia. And believe me, Virginia has quite the armpit in some places. As <laughs> Virginia is a place like, if you wanted to make me a miserable human being, put me in the middle of Virginia. <laughs> It's a, it's, if you live there, it's your home. It's a lovely place. I'm sure objectively fine. It's a great place, but I drive through there. I'm like, Oh gosh. Anyway. So, so, uh, when I went to this wedding, I was, this was all this infrastructure. Now I was visiting family in this now, but I, I just had this general feeling of all of this went into getting me here for a, a few hours to experience this wedding. But after I, it happened. I was like, I would not have missed that for anything. It was so worth it, right? It was just so good. And you start to think about creativity that way. That I think that can be uh, very helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm curious. Do you have a 
do you have like a creative mental zone or, or even a creative physical space that kind of helps you do stuff creatively? Um, I mean, Creation. I so the weird, the weird thing for me is uh, when I do street portraits, I have business cards that I hand out. Um, just feel like it makes me feel people are very persuaded by a piece of paper that anyone could print out with anything on it as a, a legitimate item for some reason. <laughs> and you lead with that too. You're like, you're walking up. It's like a badge. You're like the freaking yeah. FBI. So, like, I need your car, sir. I definitely am in a better creative space when I have a card in my hand. Um, so this is a big thing for me. It's like, if I have, if I don't have a card in my hand, I'm going to skip some portraits I should make because in that first brief few seconds, it's easy to dissuade yourself. But like, if you have it out, like when you can cut down those sort of barriers, barriers, yes, barriers to sort of getting there. It's like the card's already out. You're walking around, you know, it's like, it's just cutting those steps. Every time you could say no to doing it, like if you can remove some of those steps, I think totally. it's like an amazing thing to do. Just like, always having your like I have a camera with me almost usually except when I go to the gym and the grocery store those are about the only two times I don't have a camera with me um I just try to have a camera everywhere and I, it's like that removes one of the excuses which is I don't have a camera and then I try to always have cards with me or something and then if I'm shooting shooting I always try to have them out because it's like it's just removing those those opportunities for yourself to be like no, I shouldn't do this, or no, this isn't the one I want, or oh, the light isn't the way I want it. And it's like, that's always been a big barrier for me is like, I want to make a certain quality of image. And if I'm not sure I can in the situation, I just don't take it. And I, you need to just make, for me at least, I need to make those photographs. And you'll surprise yourself sometimes and make a strong image, and other times you'll make a bad image. But making no image is the worst option of all <laughs> absolutely so, yeah, yeah 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 so i mean that i guess that's sort of like physical tangible things i do um that's sort of the sort of physical action is there anything from like a, a contrast to sort of my physical things i do to sort of be in that state is there any sort of mental things you do or sort of a mental state you find yourself in James that kind of perpetuates it. Mm, so one thing that's, that is almost, it's very similar to what you're saying is if I need to edit a video, which can be the part that takes a lot of a uh, little bit of kicking and screaming to get to once you, when, and it, but it's fulfilling, but it's, it's, it can be difficult. It's like, Oh, I gotta sit down. I gotta cut things and do this. <clears throat> uh, I, I find that, putting myself in the right in, in my comfort zone. And so this means a lot of times this means one having just opening the project, just having it there to where all I have to do is sit down and start typing. So very similar to what you were saying. Another thing is uh, being at a desk that I can sit at and, and, so a place that I'm going to be comfortable and that is going to inspire me to create. This is a good example. This is a new desk. This turns into a stand-up desk. It has a crank. It's fantastic. Uh, we rarely use it that way, but I have this chair that's like one of those uh, stool. You know, you can go into certain Starbucks's star by, and at the end of the, the bar, they have these uh, bar stool type chairs that are pretty high. I find that that's something that helps me kind of, kind of get myself upright and, and active, right? <clears throat> That's particularly helpful. Um, I, I actually, what actually helps me is to have some white noise in the background. And I lose, like my wife will come home, she'll keep the house completely quiet and my brain has an aneurysm. I work really well in places like coffee shops where I can just kind of hear things. Like I'm not expecting somebody to interrupt me so much, but I can just kind of hear things going on. There's, there's energy happening. I think when I sit in, in silence, it, I get anxious. I'm just like, like, and what it does is it makes me want to go. It's not that I'm not able to deal with 
with the like the tragedy that is life and like silence makes me uncomfortable. You know, it's not like that, but it's more along the lines of my brain naturally goes, I need to be stimulated by something. I'm bored right now, right? And so I've learned to create this environment. One thing that I do is, which I feel like a lot of people would say it's a bad idea, but I do it and it works really well. So forget you, behavioralist. Is that a title? Uh, is I will turn on like something that is like some sort of three hour long video on YouTube that is like maybe like a game that I'm interested in, some sort of video game that I'm interested in. Uh, and and I like the person who does the commentary and I'll just let it play. Now, every now and then I'll just look up. Oh, that's fun. He's like, you know, blowing up robots right now. Look back down and, and I'll, and it helps me edit. I just feel comfortable, right? So I think being very comfortable, creating a comfort zone, a creative, creative zen zone for yourself is a way to, to help you create consistently and eliminating friction. A lot of people say that's a really good idea to separate physically your workspace from your home space, which I, I totally agree with. I think sometimes I just need to go to a Starbucks and there's something interesting that happens at a Starbucks when you're sitting at a table where you have nothing. You, you could hypothetically get on YouTube if you wanted to, but you, you're kind of there for a reason. You're like, I'm sitting at a table. There's a laptop in front of me. I don't want to be here forever. I'm going to get hungry in the next couple of hours. Uh, generally, I don't, have, yeah, I'm not, like, I don't have the funding to go buy a bunch of banana breads or whatever. So I'm, I'm there for a reason, and there's like – Get tricking your brain into that mental state is really helpful, and it helps you actually get the hard work uh, done. But I think that's a little bit different for everybody. I've I've learned that like the things that you hear when you when you watch these self help videos that are supposed to be, and th there is some of this for sure, but it's supposed to be like the the way that our brains are wired to create. Uh, I've found some things that are a little bit different that work for me. And as long as I'm creating and as long as I'm not seeing a deficit there, as long as I feel like I'm able to continually push myself to the next level, then that's fine. That's what it's all about. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think it is that sort of, it's easy to dole out advice that's very specific, but it's like, I think everyone should always kind of take things in a general sense. Like you kept touching on being, com like having that sort of comfort space or that distinctive space where you're working so i think that applies to someone who needs almost like complete sense deprivation and they may need to be in a dark room with no sound and no anything going on no windows you know that may be their editing process to a person who may need to be more in your situation where you know there's some noise there's something to sort of draw you away for a moment and then you just go back into your work but i think it's not just prescribing to oh well such and such has 12 million followers thus the way they edit or the way they sit at their desk or their choice to stand or sit or lay down when they edit or do this or that somehow is going to spur your creative process because i think in the end you as a person know best what's the sort of place that puts you into a good creative mode whether especially when it comes to like editing and post process like any of that kind of stuff you know, we kind of know what works. Like I listen to a lot of podcasts when I edit and I listen to a little bit of music. I, I listen to the same song. If it's if it's really intense editing, I can't listen to podcasts because I just don't remember anything and I'm trying to kind of get a two for one. Mm. So it's like I'll play the same song like 30 times in a row. <laughs> maybe like three, maybe like three songs, but I'll listen to them just like, again and again and again and again and for a lot of people that would just be like torturous but for me like that's my equivalent of white noise i guess well see the interesting part is i'm the same way when i'm editing photos that I'll, i can listen to something somebody talking <clears throat> and the thing is for me it, I, like i feel like i have to i feel like i have to lock my phone and, well not even that i i listen to podcasts i'm taking in like talking information so much that I feel like something bad's happening to me. Like <laughs> I'm always list I'm always listening to this. And uh, I think it's a it's a relatively beneficial thing. It's like you can't read too many books, right? But but 
I have to, the problem is, is when you edit, you can't, you do have to listen to audio and you do have to pay enough attention that you can't have somebody talking in your ear at the same time. Or your brain will explode and fall out of your ears. Uh, but when I'm editing photos, I can, you know, I can listen to a podcast or whatever, but it's like, I don't know. I think getting addicted to the process of putting yourself in a creative zone is something that can be very helpful. Like, I think that's really important. Um, and cultivating your environment. And I also think that it's a really good idea to, to go further away from just the immediate things that help you create, like what we're talking about right now, into the realm of taking care of your house, making sure you have you're washing the dishes, you've made your bed, all of these things, I think are subtly integrated into helping you be a happier, more creative, more focused person. But uh so have you I'm curious, have you have you created any so that's that's sort of habits regarding your environment. I don't know. I guess that's a very similar question. My question was sort of, have you created any habits that have been helpful to your creative process? I think you're you talking about the business card is a great example of a habit. Is there any other version of that, that you can think of? No, that's fine. Um, I mean, I guess there's sort of, I mean, this is sort of a preparation thing, but it has a degree of creativity in it. It's just like for a lot of my work shoots, like I always ask the person, especially if it's on location, obviously if it's like in a tiny closet of a studio space I work out of, like I go there, but I like to get there early and sort of pre-light and just take essentially a bunch of selfies. So I have an incredible folder of very terrible, um, but very well lit uh, self-portraits. Um, you should, you know, you could do, you, you know, what you could do well. Have you ever heard of Burning Man? Yeah. You could, you could make, you could make a 60 foot tall naked statue of yourself made entirely out of the selfies that you've taken over the last four years. Right. Maybe I can co-op that to an intern or something. That, well, I, I guess so. I mean, if they're comfortable with that. But the so that would be a raging success in the Burning Man community, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I should do. But yeah, so I mean, I think like that's sort of my ritual, I guess, it's sort of like a ritual thing um, that sort of just gets me in the right mind space, lets me know that I'm going to be starting from a, a good starting point and try to remove some early decisions in the creative process. Um, of a shoot where you kind of feel a little frazzled because you're trying to entertain the person and make sure things are doing what they're supposed to do, your lighting's right, or you're getting what you think you're getting. And I think that sort of, it builds a safety net, but also sort of like the business card, it removes some of those no's that you can run into, but I guess in a different sense in that it sort of eliminates a few thoughts of things you're gonna to have to worry about beyond focusing on the subject themselves like you have one detail pretty nailed down and you're not having to flip flop between that and this and this other issue and then you're thinking back to that it's sort of limited those options of things you need to worry about a good bit so when it comes to a particularly difficult project for you do you, well, so I find a lot of value in uh, this has been one of the most helpful creative habits for me is to split a project up into it's it's eating an elephant one bite at a time, splitting it up into into getting started somewhere. Right. And if it's if it's if for you, it's setting up a, a light and just do like getting up, doing something right? Doing something that, that lends towards the end goal, even if it's not a big deal, whatever this thing is, <clears throat> just starting there. That's a little bit easier to do than to take on the whole project in your mind. For me, if it's editing, it's just like sitting down and saying, I'm just going to edit for 10 minutes. And once you go, you start going, like you pay, you pass 10 minutes, spend three hours and you're like, Oh, wow, I, I finished. But 
but does it, have you found that to be helpful to you and how does that manifest itself? Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely, it like reminds me of some, uh, I wish I could remember a podcast, but it's talking about brushing one tooth and like a best way to form the habit to brush your teeth is to start by just brush one tooth. Because if you brush one tooth every day, you're probably going to go, well, I might as well brush two teeth. And then you're like, well, I'm <laughs> and so, but it's like, you know, it's starting with that very small thing. So I think. I love that. That's awesome. For me, it's, uh, it starts with just sort of like, starting to form a concept, even if I go in a complete another direction, like I always, I create a Google Drive folder and I put in some inspiration images, just loose things that may be for lighting, it may be for the composition, it may be for the kind of subject I'm shooting. And that at least says like, okay, I've started the creative process. Even if I don't, I go through the shoot, and I don't do anything like that. So it usually starts with that. And then if it's a bigger shoot, I'll usually write out a shot list and sort of be like, I want to do this with this modifier or okay there's a window here i want to do this um, and this can happen on location or before the shoot if i know what it's going to be so i think it's sort of like starts with sort of a rough mood board kind of thing moves into sort of a written out shot list and even if like i've had plenty of shoots where i mean i'd say a big chunk of them i don't do any of those or i may start with a couple of them and then completely riff in another direction but it gives me that starting point. I'm not wasting that creative energy on trying to come up with that first concept and kind of, it lets you just start creating when you get into the actual shoot. So those are kind of, I think, the first two steps I make in a lot of my work. Totally, totally. So let's, uh, let's talk about some of your work now. I think that'd be fun. All right, let's do it. All right, I'm going to, so this, I would love for this to be streamlined and like I push a button and, and it, there's like a, there's like a clock wipe transition or like one of the Star Wars transitions. But in this case, uh, we're going to, I'm going to share the application window and it's going to screen share. And for everybody, can you oh, see this? There it is. Hey. All right. So you're looking at my notes now, but here, I wonder if I can, I'm going to drag this over just enough so I can still see what's going on over here. Does that look reasonable on your screen? Does that look horrible? That looks pretty reasonable. Okay. Very good. So I'll put that right there. Okay. Present. Oh, I have to present to everyone. Hi, there we are. All right. So I want to talk about a few of your photos. And for everybody who is listening at audio uh, land, audio, uh, audio, I was trying to think of like a country, the end of a country, that, but like audio is the beginning. Didn't work out though. Every country that I was thinking of ends with land. <laughs> audio, okay. Uh, there you go. I'm going to explain these the best I can. The first photo that we're looking at is a portrait of a girl and with this beautiful, interesting lighting, a, a combination of blue and pink light. She has pink hair and, uh, and it's just, overall it's this minimalistic image, very simple portrait in a lot of ways, but also very complex in a lot of ways of, uh, of a sort of Tokyo-esque type of lighting situation of a girl. <clears throat> Will, I would love to know how you shot this and how you set up the lights for this, and also what was sort of the story behind the photo. Okay, um, so I guess we'll start with the narrative, because that kind of explains the lighting. Um, so this girl is a uh, girl who just recently graduated from uh, fashion design school and she had actually won this subpoena cotton big uh, contest where she got to show her collection at new york fashion week and uh, paris fashion week so she was actually like it was pretty legit uh, it was super impressive to get to see everything so like naturally sort of it being a fashion focused piece like I wanted to take the lighting in a direction that was a bit less traditional. Um, and then also I knew she had pink hair, so I thought that would play really well with some gelled lighting because, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of the pinks sort of easily could be affected. So the interesting thing with this shot is, like, it looks like there's two gelled lights, but it's actually a pink background, her, her pink hair, and then it's actually a blue light. So there's a normal non-gelled light hitting the left side of her face. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there's a gelled blue light that's kind of controlled and make sure it's not hitting the background, um, hitting her face. And then there's just sort of that transition zone. 
So it was just sort of finding a balance between the two that didn't feel crazy because gel stuff can kind of go really weird and sort of tacky looking really fast and hopefully this doesn't look tacky it no there's a lot of like nuance to the way that it's laid out like it doesn't feel it doesn't feel uh it doesn't feel tacky and it doesn't feel sort of i guess contrived and weird and misplaced or anything like that like it has a it has a very uh it has a very brilliant nuanced quality to it i'm curious how did you what is the background um it's just a roll of Pink paper that we had left over from some stuff we'd done a long time ago, and the roll's almost dead. Um, so I just thought, like, her hair color being like a sort of pink purple would kind of blend to it, and it would let the gel not be too crazy because it's really sort of only two colors going on, and then a little bit of like natural skin tone. So it's not like 18 colored gels going on at once. Were you worried that it would be too pink? Yeah, this was, I kind of just, this was one of those things where she was at the shoot and I just serendipitously was like, let's use this background and it may look terrible, but we'll start here. And then it actually worked. So I just kind of got a little lucky there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Hold on, let me, I'm going to double check and make sure that people are actually seeing the screen sharing aspect of this. Okay, great. Beautiful. Okay. I was making sure they weren't just like, here's Will's face, and he's talking about some pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. That could be problematic. It's happened before. It will happen again. Uh, so, oh, but very quickly. Uh, one thing I love about this photo is I think that it took some interesting forethought to understand that if you didn't have that extra point of light on the left side, left us, left side of her face, it would be the photo... Like that really adds to the photo. It would be very blue and pink and uh, not so poppy if that was not there. So that's an interesting example of a detail in lighting and an understanding of lighting to help the photo come together in a in a perfect way and elevate it. Now I think you could get away with just like a blue gel. I think it'd be kind of interesting and moody, but the fact that you added that extra little punch, I don't even know how people work studio lighting like they do it's amazing but um the fact that it added that little extra punch is is great okay we're gonna move on to the next one now we make this one a little bit bigger by the way if we're talking about creative momentum and productivity oh my gosh yeah i haven't even <clears throat> sorry i haven't even mentioned this this is a huge huge piece of my daily process of creating i have to write things consistently. I have to continually be fleshing out ideas in my head. I have uh, things in this app called Notion, which a lot of people never heard of, I think, but it's a fantastic note-taking app. It's very intuitive, but it works sort of like you're building a web page almost where you can go in and add different, like you can add text, pay, uh, header, subheader, you, bulleted list, toggle list, to-dos. You can add images like I've done here. You can pull the images off of Instagram. It's just amazing. And it, I found that that is one of the most important keys to me actually creating consistent videos is, that, is having a list of things in various states of development and just continually pouring myself into that environment and creating. And that was how I sort of put together this entire live stream because I have to have some level of organization or we will talk about nothing. So that, that has been proven. Quite <laughs> yeah, we've had those run-ins before, right? Um, okay, so the next photo we have is a really interesting environmental portrait in the style of environmental portraits that I love. Or that's what I would call it. Is that what you would call it, Will? Yeah, I, I would definitely call it an environmental portrait. I mean, it's shot with a really wide angle lens. Totally. A lot of focus on what's in the scene, not just the person. It's yeah, it's, it's like a balance of the two. So, um, so there's a lot. I think there's a lot to talk about with this image. But anyway, so the the image is of a woman sitting on top of, I guess, what is it like a guitar case or something? Like, a, like one of those like old chests kind of things with like oh okay metal class blocks you know it's like old i guess like really old luggage like the really old luggage oh okay 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 count dracula time period gotcha gotcha um and that's what we all strive for with our luggage 
Yeah. Count, Count Dracula, Count Dracula styling. So uh, we have that. She's sitting in a room that looks a bit like a log cabin. And, but it, it, the whole, the, everything in the room is wood paneled, which is insane. Uh, like all the walls, the floor, everything's wood paneled. It has this old style TV phone. Looks like it's from the, the, from 1601. Uh, there's an interesting little security camera on the top, but there's uh, oh, the roof is uh, kind of white text. I think I'm getting a little bit de- too detailed at this point. There's a poster on the wall of like a cranium and so sort of like a diagram of a person's head. There's a chest. So it's this environmental portrait of, of a woman sitting in sort of a log cabin type setting, <clears throat> looking out into the distance, contemplating all of life's mysteries. So, and an interesting point of light on her face that separates her from the background. Well, that's my first note. But Will, tell me about this photo. Yeah, so um, this was actually for uh, a profile story we did on a couple. Um, this woman's name's Kim. She's one of the owners of one of those, like, escape house, escape places, so, like the escape room, which is, like, called Escape Artist Greenville, I think. Um, okay. What does that mean, escape room? It's like one of those places where they build these very elaborate rooms and they have this sort of like there's all these clues hidden and you have to like find out this and then this will lead to unlocking that and then if you find out this code this is hidden it's like a puzzle yeah and you have like a certain amount of time to get out of the room so they well they themselves like build these elaborate sets which is why the room's kind of weird like they're it's just in an old office building so that's why the ceiling's like this white <clears> textured thing but i tried to have as little of it as possible because it's sort of it, it's sort of not quite right for the space and that's why the space is sort of this kind of menagerie of things that aren't quite right like it's it, it's like very much a stage um, I um I think so. I'm assuming the cameras in the room for when they actually lock you in. You you don't get to leave, and they're preparing to murder you, and they can like talk to you and see what you're doing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Got it. So this is this is really pretty simple lighting. I mean, the lighting in the space was pretty atrocious. Um, so I just had one key light uh, camera left. So and it's just barely out of frame. And because she's kind of a little closer to it than the wall and she's a little bit lighter um, in tone, she sort of pops out a little bit from the light. You can see the shadow falling on the wall behind her. So it's just sort of set to that side and it's sort of just dragging light into the whole scene. The big thing for making it feel pretty natural is that I wanted to balance it at a low enough power that you can still see the TV. So, um, Oh, to totally. Yeah. A relatively slow shutter speed. And I had to make sure the output wasn't too high because I wanted the TV to seem like it was still giving off light. And there's actually a lamp behind her. And I, you can see there's a little bit of highlight coming in from how the light's coming off that lamp. So I didn't want to completely kill those sources because then it would just feel lit. And I feel like with lighting the big goal is for it to feel like you just got lucky and walked into a space that naturally had light that was doing what you wanted um so this was sort of about creating a narrative and then just as like a sort of subtle reference point i kind of like the idea of having her look out because she kind of juxtaposes with the poster um, oh totally yeah i didn't even notice that sort of provides that sort of balance to the frame um and then she's obviously offset on like a super classic rule of thirds setup, which is pretty easy. So it, it, it was more about the light not getting in the way of the photo, but just helping it enhance it since the only light in the room was like really terrible above head fluorescent light sets. Oh, that's the best though, Will. <laughs> that is never the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that, I like the color palette because you have – you the general set of colors is mostly brown, just a whole lot of brown. Like everything's brown, even things that shouldn't be brown, like the uh the what's it called? The air conditioning vent. They painted to be like wood, or maybe that's just a wooden air conditioning vent. The but there's also like little splashes of blue, which I find intriguing, and it it connects her to the poster. I just I didn't realize that the the that she's looking the away like the poster is. That's really brilliant. And the blue uh there's like a bit of burgundy too like her pants and the t- you know it has that kind of vibe to it but it's got a nice set of contrasts to it and it feels i think one of the interesting 
issues to take on as a photographer and something that you can try to go after to make your photos better is to take a very complex situation and try to figure out how to make it feel minimalistic. And I think that's what you've done here. Everything feels very cohesive and simple, even though there's a lot of elements to work with. Yeah. And I mean, I think some of that comes down to being really deliberate with framing. So like I made sure not to cut off any of the poster. I made sure to leave room underneath her feet and underneath the object so there's sort of no awkward breaks in the lines like on the left side of the frame the window and the table are all framed out she's placed in a relatively clean spot i mean it would be a little cleaner if she was slightly to the left not right at that bookcase but it's sort of like elements are pretty definitely. yeah nothing's coming out of her head in a weird way no it's just kind of keeping those elements separate because it is a space that could easily feel really cluttered. When the, and the light is a, a key to doing that, right? This this point of light that separates her so strongly from the background and makes it, it makes it. And it's important to think about this photo without that light because <laughs> it would be a little bit different. Yes, it would. It would have a completely different effect. Who is she, by the way? Like, what's the story of her in this? Um, so she's just one of the owners. So, I mean, there's, it, it's like, I don't know how much of the narrative it was more just like creating a captivating image, um, within a space. So it was more just kind of finding a way to showcase both the spaces that they put in all this time and effort to create while also representing one of the owners themselves, um, sort of within the space. So it's more of just kind of fulfilling to kind of simple editorial purposes. Totally. Okay, next. <clears throat> Make this one smaller. All right. So I wanted to do a bit of a balance between like environmental stuff and straight up portraits. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about this one. I, I'm confused because this one almost feels like it could be a street portrait or it could be something that's planned or it could be your friend or maybe you ended up in a bad situation and you joined a gang. Tell us about this photo, Will. All right, well, that's good. I'm glad that it's not so straightforward because I think one of the big things I've been working towards is making my, this is actually a street portrait, um, but is making my street work and my personal work uh, less easily separated um, and working with light in interesting ways when it's either natural light or, you know, when I'm using studio strips and stuff like that um, anyway if you've always, always uh, wanted to romanticize thing oh i'm sorry let me explain this photo really quick um so this is a shot of a, a guy looks a uh, semi surfer looking type of fellow got some blonde hair a little bit longer but still short blue light uh there's an interesting spot of light on the eye and the rest of the faces and body is relatively dark overall very blue moody image there it looks like there's some blinds opening in the background that let some blue light in uh that it feels like that it's probably not what it is and then there's it's an interesting striping effect between that that light blue and the darker blue shadow go ahead all right um so this was shot i was in savannah georgia and uh, i was at the art museum and I just saw this guy and I hadn't really made like any street portraits the whole trip and I was kind of mad at myself because I felt like oh, I'm, I'm on this trip like I'd love to come back with a few images that I'm proud of um it's good to get away from where I usually work because I sort of have my set spots in Greenville that I know will work for photos so it sort of feels a little bit like cheating sometimes um mm -hmm. whereas when you're in a new city it's like you really gotta work to make an interesting photo and you really gotta observe the scene so um this was a case of sort of taking the other, per like keeping an open mind because I originally kind of planned out the shot to be next to this window with this really soft kind of light that was going to fall off fast because it was sort of this frosted glass door with a lot of bright light blasting into it, but it was like really diffused. Um, but the guy was like, hey, can we take it in this next room? And there, the wall, the windows, floor to ceiling were like uh, striped bars so and the sun was coming through sort of right before golden hour so it was shooting through in the sort of light beam way and then in some way just through like again it's like with street portraiture for me it's like taking the time like we probably shot for five or six minutes which is like pretty long for a street portrait kind of thing um and we just sort of found this perfect positioning where 
the lights coming through just like this bar. So for some reason in the spot where you're standing, it just kind of highlighted the eye. Mm. And there was just a really nice balance between like, it didn't push him into complete shadow. Like I wanted to maintain, you know, you can still see detail in the face, but it's sort this of- This is why it's good to shoot uh, raw, by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, and also it was like, I think it was just time of day. There was like a mixture of hard and it was just like sort of, enough ambient coming in but then there's this harder light it's sort of like when you open blinds at certain times of the day and there's like streaks of light but then there's also enough sort of soft fill where it sort of balances better um Mm. so it was just sort of finding that spotlight sort of like you said like i used I, i tend to like to romanticize my work so i wanted to create something that sort of felt like it could be a studio portrait or something done very intentional Um, But it was very, very spontaneous portrait. And the blue actually comes more from split toning and also comes from, shout out James, because uh, this is one of the presets. No way! Link is in the description. Presets for tons of my photos. Like, yeah. Yeah, Beautiful. I use a ton of your presets. Like, sometimes I'll make a few tweaks, but definitely, like, as a starting point on a ton of stuff. Um, So that's what brought in a bit of the blues. And then... I may have brushed the skin a bit to pull out a little bit in the eye spot, or it may have just been the light. I can't remember, but yeah, this was definitely one of your presets. Super I cool. The, I think it was one of the cinema one, the cinematic one. The like. Uh, oh yeah, I see it now. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that nice red, reddish shadows, bluish highlights, that sort of thing. Yeah. Totally. This is um, one of my favorite photos I've taken in a while, so I'm glad you chose. No, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I really like it, and I think that it's a it's a great example of this is like the the fullest force intensity of you taking a street portrait and romanticizing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is like some crazy futuristic looking uh, stuff, but I, I think the point of light on the eye is crucial for the photo to sort of make sense, and I think it's also interesting. I'm gonna assume that the the tones were not this cool that like this wasn't the time of day. It was more so the way that you post process it, processed it. It was definitely more of the post processing. Um, I mean, it pushed a little bit this way, but there was definitely a a good bit of the post doing a good bit of the heavy lifting. And like in my editing process, I usually create several of a photograph and sort of throw on a few different presets and, of starting points and just to sort of ruminate on like where i want the photo to go and then kind of start to hone in on what i actually want to do with it from there totally it has a, it has a tremendous mood to it because of the coolness and it works really well and this is another example of when you're post-processing it's a really good idea to balance a warm shadow with a cool tone so that the coolness doesn't just overwhelm the photo and i yeah. think that that's something that i was trying to do with that preset that was something i learned i think sometime around making these presets is how important it is to have that balance it makes the photo really have a lot more uh, depth and dynamic to it as opposed to just feeling like a freezing cold photo that contrast really helps out okay this is actually my favorite photo of the of the of the four here i really like this one because it's just a, it's just a really interesting environmental portrait that feels very natural, but at the same time it's lit quite well. And you do such a great job at finding the place to put the person's head. That is one of the most difficult parts of taking a good portrait uh, where there's anything going on but just a white background. So well done there. But anyway, we have a photo of an older man. Uh, it looks like he's in some sort of wood shop or something. Got a bunch of little C clamps. I guess that's what you call them. I don't know. Uh, on on the table of, of varying different sizes. This man is is very much ready for any sort of apocalyptic situation that would involve clamping something. He's in a wood shop. Uh, inter- like lots of things going on in the background. It's a it's feels organized, but also um, used, uh, you know, nice garage wood shop. And he's, it looks like a smiley old man who likes to work on his things. And then we have a light in the background. <laughs> we have a window in the background. We have an interesting pressure hose thing. One of those yellow, uh, springy ones hanging down. And that is the photo for audio listeners. Okay. So what was the story with this one? 
Um, so this was for an arts package we were doing for the Greenville Journal, and um, we kind of photographed different people different ways. Um, but with him, I kind of wanted to include something he was actually working on. So like, as I was setting up for this photo, he was tight putting all these clamps on this piece of wood. Um, did he need that many clamps for this project? Yeah, he actually did um, because it was he was shaping all this wood from straight to a curve shape, and like you have to clamp it in all of these little spots, or else it'll it won't warp, it like won't bend correctly. Um, Whoa! He had a much more eloquent answer, but that's my butchered uh, answer to why he has I don't know like twelve clamps. <laughs> he totally. Told me his clamp collection was the was the end everyone was envious of it that was in the woodworking community he's been <laughs> collecting his clamps for like 30 years now so he he owns it and deserves it um, oh my gosh but, everybody uh, in the town wants bob's clamps yeah i mean this shot a lot of it from like a technical standpoint was just finding that balance a lot of people are too heavy-handed with their strobe use so like i think a lot of people shy away from using lights because they see photos we've all seen them like it, it, it they just look so fake like they the, the flash is too hard um dramatic yeah no that is that is a great out. point like it, they they don't feel subtle and some of that's like using a, a large soft modifier but the other thing is like uh this image is blended with a lot of in the ambient light um in the scene so like the shadow that's on the right side of his face that is really about what his whole face would look like. So I'm not crushing everything really dark and I'm letting the overhead lights and I'm letting the windows. There's a window that obviously directly behind him and then also on the far right of the frame just cropped out barely. There's another window. So those are sort of providing the light to the background, sort of balancing that scene. And then the light on him is just slightly off camera left and sort of feathered away from him so just the edge of it's catching his face it's sort of just subtly bringing detail back in um but a lot of that is just sort of i always tell people it's like you shoot the ambient first and you figure out how you want the scene to look um without the light and then you add the light to your subject mm. or bring back in the detail you want but working in two steps is how i work almost always is when shooting environmentals is i shoot for the ambient and then I shoot for the strobe because you don't know what a scene's gonna look like without the strobe until you shoot it first without it. And then when you add it, it becomes a lot easier to balance the two um, and sort of find that middle ground where it, you know, it could actually just be, you know, a window right there, even though obviously there, there is no window. Um, and the other thing was just kind of, I shoot a lot with really wide angle lenses. So this is probably shot at 20 millimeter. Um, I'll shoot as wide as 15 millimeter, but I don't think this is that wide. Um, but it could be. I can't remember. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this, is, this is actually a pretty small woodworking space. So mm -hmm. the, the way to sort of give a wider breadth of it and sort of provide a photo that gives enough of that context, um, a lot of times I just have to work with really, really wide angle lenses. So. I think a big key to this photo and the photo of the environmental the girl earlier is, you know, finding that framing element. You really hit on it when you said, um, you know, his head in that window. It just worked perfect. Like the window is clean, simple. It provides this sort of order to a frame that has a lot of elements in it. Um, and it sort of just immediately draws the attention. And then again, the frame's just set up on a pretty simple, pretty close to rule of thirds um, setup. And then the rest of it's just kind of dialing in the pose, dialing in, you know, expressions and kind of working through those things step by step. So you're not worrying about the lighting and the expression and posing and the position all at the same time. It's sort of like a piecemeal approach of how I kind of approach most of my images. Yeah, I think this is a fantastic example of masterful a uh, light balancing because you're dealing with a lot of interesting dynamics here that could be very challenging to many photographers where you have a window in the background, which I mean, anytime you have a window in the background, you run the risk of just blowing everything out and you can still see a lot of details in the shades. It feels very natural, feels authentic, like what it would actually look like if you were there and what your eye would see. 
uh, you you also have the guy's head in the window, which is insane. It's hard to do in terms of lighting, um, but I think that you balance the the strobe well, and also you have the, the dynamic, wonderful lighting that can come from a woodworking shop. <laughs> that was sarcasm, uh, and you have these you know these lights on the ceiling that produce probably a bit warmer light. It's not not particularly intriguing. And the way that you balance this, and you, you know, it doesn't feel too warm, doesn't feel too cool, doesn't feel too uh, off center and unbalanced and and uncomfortable. Like it's just, it's just super well done. And the framing, this is something that I spend so much time working on in my shots, is the framing of around the edges is incredibly important. I always talk about uh, Steve McCurry and how he pays very close attention. You can tell to his overall composition, but the fr around the edges is where he really shines. Nothing comes in in a weird way. He's working with situations where, where there's a lot of clutter in the background. A lot of times that he would have to deal with and everything, everything, uh, everything, it feels so intentional. It feels like he, he masterfully worked in certain things and out certain things and the way that you framed a wood shop, which is just, a, a, you know, has a lot of clutter going on, is brilliant. Nothing nothing feels weird. I like it. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, well done. It was, it was a little daunting at first. Yeah, sure, sure. Totally. Totally. Um, but this is the value of creating consistently. Because if you didn't and you just showed up in this situation and you had a camera phone, it would not look like this. Not at all. Let's see. Not at all. Stop screen sharing. There's my face. Stop with the thing. Make sure this is still working right. We'll sing a song. Oh man. Oh man. Uh oh. Danger zone. Highway to the yeah. danger zone. Bails me out when he asks those questions, but yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, now, I was looking forward to hearing your voice, but I haven't been able to pull it off yet. Highway to the danger zone. That's the part of 80s music that just did nothing for me. Close. There we go. <clears throat> okay. Very good. Well, I think that's about it. Well, I'm going to let you get on to the rest of your priorities. Um, and building the quilt that I know that you have been so passionately working towards. Yeah, that's actually what I'm presenting at Burning Man this year. Is a, just a quilt of selfies, you know. A <laughs> selfie so, quilt. I want it to be more grandma appropriate. Uh, so it's like it's more for like the hot rodding grandmas of uh, mm. of Burning Man, not the the young kids. These well, days. you know they don't they don't get the attention that they deserve as a demographic when it comes to the Burning Man community. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to bring it to them. Like they're. They have money. They can come to Burning Man. They like yeah. fun. Let's just have some quilts. Why? What's wrong with some quilts? Old people like to be naked in the desert too. Yeah, old people love nudist beaches. Yeah, like I mean, well, just being naked anywhere. Yeah, like they, they like this, like the locker room. Like old dudes just love to be naked. Like all old people do. Yeah, and we both have <laughs> intel to make that claim. We both know what we're talking about. Yes, that is certified that's like like the tomato meter on round tomatoes it's like that is that is uh we need to come up with our own meter to measure. five naked grandmas <laughs> oh i hope that's not the title <laughs> <I guess. laughs> okay well that's gonna be the end of this podcast on that note will thank you so much for joining he just you can't see it but he just saluted and it was beautiful um Thank you so much for joining. Uh, you have a good rest of your week. We're going to talk soon. Uh, it's always so fun talking to you about your projects and what's going on. And I think that we we have an interesting sameness, but we bring different dynamics to the conversation. And I love that. Um, but you guys can find, well, I'll link to him below, but you can find him on Instagram. Uh, just Black Avenue, right? Yeah, pretty simple. W-A-C-A-V-E-N-U-E. Is that right? Pretty yeah, pretty close. That's okay, pretty well, close. yeah. You can find him over there. And uh, he's posting fantastic Instagram bangers, as the youth say, at all times. Keep following him. He does good stuff. 
And you guys have a lovely day. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. And listening too. And you can also find me on those places Instagram at James Red, Twitter at James Red. Uh, engage on YouTube, engage everywhere. Okay, goodbye.